The genus Neisseria contains two important human pathogens. Number one, the Neisseria meningitidis, and the second one is Neisseria gonorrhoeae. Assalamu alaikum, lovely students. Today we are going to look at Neisseria meningitidis. But before getting started, I'd like to tell you guys that these videos are meant for educational purposes. Things and treatments may change with time. If I get wrong or miss anything, your input is always welcome in the comments section. So, let's jump straight into the video. Neisseria meningitidis. Its another name is meningococcus. It is a gram-negative diplococcus, which means that two coccus occurs together and they form a pair, just like the one you can see there. It's responsible for fermenting maltose and glucose, that's why it is maltose glucose fermenter. As its name shows that, it is responsible for causing meningitis, disseminated meningococcemia. And the most severe form of meningococcemia is the life-threatening waterhouse Richardson syndrome. And this bacterium belongs to the family Neisseriaceae. It is catalase positive. Catalase is an enzyme released by certain bacteria and is not released by certain other bacteria. For those of you guys, who do not know what is catalase test catalase does what it converts hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen and oxygen is responsible for forming bubbles Neisseria being catalase positive will perform that test and some bacteria who are catalase negative like strep bacteria they will not perform that test means that they will not convert hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen this bacterium is also oxidase positive. It is an obligate aerobe and is facultative intracellular bacterium. It does not produce beta-lactamase like the Neisseria gonorrhoeae does. Neisseria gonorrhoeae produces the beta-lactamase like penicillinase because it has some strains that has resistance against the penicillin, the antibiotic. Lecture outline. As we're done with the introduction, now we'll be looking at the morphology, habitat in transmission, life cycle, pathogenesis, clinical findings, lab diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and at the end, as usual, we'll review the lecture. Morphology. This organism, the Neisseria meningitidis, it is oval and kind of kidney shaped. It varies in size from 0.6 to 1 micrometer. It is pink or red in color, being gram-negative bacteria. Structure. It has got thin peptidoglycan layer in its cell wall. Due to that, it does not retain the dye and it stains pink or red. It is an encapsulated bacterium. It means that it has got a prominent polysaccharide capsule that plays a really important role in the virulence of this bacterium. This bacterium also has an endotoxin in its outer membrane that is lipooligosaccharide, in contrast to the gram-negative rods, especially the enteric ones, who has got the lipopolysaccharide. This bacterium, the Neisseria meningitidis, is non-spore-forming and non-motile. As you can see in this picture, this bacterium is a diplococcus. It is pink in color and varies in size from 0.6 to 1 micrometer, and it is oval in shape. Let's talk about the division of Neisseria meningitidis. As we know, it is also called meningococcus. This meningococcus is divided into at least 13 serologic groups on the basis of antigenicity of their capsular polysaccharides. Five serotypes, the A, B, C, Y, and W135, they are really important because they cause the most cases of meningitis and meningococcemia. Habitat. Humans are the only natural hosts for meningococcus and this organism inhabits or colonizes the membranes of nasopharynx. It becomes part of the transient flora of upper respiratory tract. So if it is part of that, so people having that in their normal flora are carriers of that organism and carriers are usually asymptomatic. Transmission. Neisseria meningitidis is transmitted via respiratory or airborne droplets like coughing or sneezing. There are certain risk factors like patients with asymptomatic Dysplenia, maybe functional or anatomic, and patients with sickle cell anemia or patients having other encapsulated organisms like Haemophilus influenza, strep pneumonia are more susceptible to Neisseria meningitidis infections. Pathogenesis. We are going to start off with virulence factors. The first one is IgA1 protease, that is immunoglobulin A1 protease. It cleaves the mucosal IgA and the reason behind that is that helps the bacteria to attach to the membranes, the mucous membranes of the upper respiratory tract in order to cause the infection. The second really high yield virulence factor is polysaccharide capsule. 
It is antiphagocytic. That enables the organism to resist phagocytosis by polymorphonuclear leukocytes like neutrophils or macrophages. And this capsule is the immunogen and is used in certain vaccines against Neisseria meningitidis. The third virulence factor is lipooligosaccharide endotoxin. It is responsible for causing the release of cytokines like tumor necrotic factor alpha and interleukin 1. What happens when the endotoxin is released. This causes fever, shock, and other pathophysiological changes. The fourth virulence factor is adhesins. They promote bacterial attachment and prevent lymphocyte activation. The fifth virulence factor is factor H binding protein. What does it do? It reduces opsonization activity. Okay, let me explain that to you. Factor H binding protein present on the meningococcus binds to the factor H, an inhibitor of complement factor C3B. The presence of factor H on the surface of meningococcus reduces the opsonization activity of C3B and reduces the amount of membrane attack complex produced. Factor H binding protein is also an immunogen that is also used in certain vaccines that work against Neisseria. Meningitis. As I told you, that polysaccharide capsule is really high yield when it comes to virulence factors. Let me explain that to you. Normally, what happens when a bacterium enters a human body? Its membrane is tagged. It means that bacterium is tagged with IgG or C3B. And this tagging process is called opsonization. And after that, what happens is that signals are sent to spleen to send your macrophages for phagocytosis. The spleen sends the splenic macrophages phages they come and phagocytose the organism. A human body relies on opsonization and phagocytosis both in order to get rid of the infection. What happens when there's no spleen as in case of overwhelming post-splenectomy infection? Because spleen has been removed. There will be no phagocytosis, only opsonization cannot take the bacterium out of the human body. So what will happen that bacteria will increase its number and increased number of bacteria will definitely cause a more severe infection. And this type of infection is called overwhelming systemic infection. Other kinds of encapsulated organisms that I told you, like people having such encapsulated organisms, are susceptible to infections caused by Neisseria meningitidis. These organisms are strep pneumonia. I do have a detailed video on that bacterium. If you want to know more about that, browse the channel. The second encapsulated organism is Haemophilus influenza and the third one, obviously the one we are discussing today, is Neisseria meningitidis. The type of pathogenesis will be pyogenic. Okay, let's talk about what happens when the bacterium, the meningococcus, enters from nasopharynx. It then attaches to the nasopharynx mucosa via pili. It then enters the blood and spread to specific sites such as meninges or joints or be disseminated throughout the body causing meningococcemia. Neisseria meningitidis is responsible for causing certain diseases. Most common of them is the community-acquired meningitis, but it can also cause meningococcemia that in its severe form is waterhouse Richardson syndrome. As we know that the hematogenous spread of bacterium occurs for disseminated infections, so definitely there will be bacteremia. Let's talk about meningitis. Meningitis is caused by Neisseria meningitidis when? When it enters the brain. After entering the brain, it crosses the blood CSF barrier, the cerebrospinal fluid barrier. Then it enters the CSF and replicates there and causes inflammation of the surrounding meninges, these ones. Okay, memorizing meningitis has become so easy with these three steps. Entering into the brain, after entry, what happens? Crossing the CSF barrier, then replicating in the CSF and causing inflammation of the meninges. Disseminated meningococcemia. Neisseria meningitidis spreads via blood in whole body. It releases lipooligosaccharide endotoxin that has massive inflammatory response that results in increased capillary permeability and activation of coagulation. This causes disseminated intravascular coagulation, also called DIC. Now, as we know, there's a coagulation problem. So coagulation consumes the platelets resulting in thrombocytopenia. What's thrombocytopenia? Decreased amount of platelets. So, decreased platelets leads to increased bleeding tendency. This will present as petechial rash over the trunk or lower limb or extremities. And damage to epithelial cells along with increased capillary permeability leads to leakage of blood. 
This will cause generalized hypovolemia or hypovolemic shock. Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. It is an inflammatory response in small blood vessels of adrenals present at the top of kidneys that results in endothelial damage and rupture of blood vessels. Due to DIC, the disseminated intravascular coagulation, clotting is hard. That leads to leakage of blood in interstitial space of adrenals, the adrenal glands, right? This, along with generalized hyperperfusion, leads to ischemia and necrosis of the gland. This ultimately causes adrenal insufficiency, also known as Addisonian crisis. Clinical findings. Community-acquired bacterial meningitis presents with fever, headache, photophobia, nuchal rigidity, and altered mental status. Let's talk about nuchal rigidity. We can assess it by these two signs. First one is Koenig's sign. There will be flexion of thigh, and extension of knee and this will cause a pain in the knee this is positive Koenig signs it means that there's no rigidity the second one is Brudzinski sign when there is reflexive hip flexion so head will be elevated this is positive Brudzinski's neck sign Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome it will present as fever having adrenal gland hemorrhagic necrosis, disaminated intravascular coagulation, thrombocytopenia. There are petechiae or the purpura present on trunk or the lower extremities, functional Addison's crisis, hypovolemic shock is also present. Lab diagnosis. We'll need samples of blood and spinal fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. On microscopy, it is revealed that this bacterium is gram-negative because of pink or red color after the straining. This bacterium is ovoid in shape or kidney-shaped. It is 0.6 to 1 micrometer in size. As you can see there, this one. And it is diplococcus. Culture. Neisseria meningitidis is cultured on chocolate agar, not blood agar. We are going to talk why not blood. And the chocolate agar is incubated at 37 degrees Celsius in 5 percent carbon dioxide colonies formed will be smooth around moist uniform large they are gray or brown in color and they have a glistening surface the shiny surface why not blood agar why the chocolate agar the reason behind is that the growth of Neisseria meningitidis is inhibited by certain toxic trace metals and fatty acids present in blood agar when this blood agar is heated, these toxic trace metals and fatty acids get inactivated that leads to the growth of the bacterium on that agar. And after the heating of blood agar, it becomes the chocolate agar. So chocolate agar is actually the blood agar just heated up. Others will also go for sugar fermentation like of maltose and glucose will look. If this bacterium does so, it is Neisseria meningitidis. Immunofluorescence can also be used to identify these species. However, a procedure that can assist in the rapid diagnosis of meningococcal meningitis is the latex agglutination test, which detects capsular polysaccharide in the spinal fluid. And on blood tests, we'll find out that there's an increased level of polymorphonuclear leukocytes. Treatment. As we know, that Neisseria meningitidis does not release the beta-lactamase, for example, the penicillinase. So we can use penicillin G for its treatment or infections caused by it. And we can also use third-generation cephalosporins like ceftriaxone for the treatment of infections caused by Neisseria meningitidis. We'll also use rifampin. Prevention. Chemoprophylaxis and immunization both are used to prevent meningococcal diseases. There are certain vaccines that work against infections caused by Neisseria meningitidis. And these are classified into two. Number one, uh, vaccines that work against ACYW135 serotypes and the second one that work against the serotype B. The ones that work against the ACYW135 serotypes are further subdivided into conjugated and unconjugated vaccines. And the one for B serotype are further classified into factor H binding protein vaccines and certain other surface proteins. We're going to look at them. The conjugated and unconjugated are... Those vaccines, they've got no B polysaccharide and they are not immunogenic. While the ones against serotype B both have surface proteins. The conjugated vaccine has a capsular polysaccharide and that capsular polysaccharide is conjugated to a carrier protein. But in 
unconjugated vaccine, there's a no such conjugation. There is high antibody titers in children of conjugated vaccines, but of unconjugated vaccine, there's a no such uh, increased titer. And children varying uh, from 11 to 12 years of age, college children and travelers, they definitely are recommended to have conjugated vaccines, but unconjugated vaccine is recommended for children aging um, about 11 years. FHBP means factor H binding protein and that one is immunogenic. And this factor H blocks C3B binding. Others include NADA, that is NICEREAL adhesin A. The second one is NHBA, that is NICEREAL heparin binding antigen. Next one is OMV, that is outer membrane vesicle or pore A. Let's talk about the further classification of vaccines. Conjugated vaccines are further classified into four forms. Menactra, that contains four polysaccharides conjugated to diphtheria toxoid as carrier protein. The second one is Menvil, that contains the four polysaccharides conjugated to a non-toxic mutant of diphtheria toxin as the carrier protein. And the third one is Menhybrix, that contains two polysaccharides, the C and Y, plus the capsular polysaccharide of Haemophilus influenza all conjugated to tetanus toxoid. Next one is menafriwac that is used in meningitis belt of Africa. It is a conjugate vaccine that contains only group A polysaccharide. The unconjugated menomium vaccine, it contains only four polysaccharides and they are not conjugated to a carrier protein. As we discussed earlier, there's conjugation to a carrier protein in conjugated vaccines and there's no conjugation to a carrier protein in unconjugated vaccines. The example of the vaccine of factor H binding protein is Trumenba and for the other ones, it's Bexero. All right, guys, let's wrap up everything in this short table. The organism we discussed today is Neisseria meningitidis. It is responsible for causing meningitis, meningococcemia, waterhouse Richardson syndrome and don't forget bacteremia. It is transmitted via respiratory or airborne droplets. Humans are the only hosts and it colonizes the nasopharynx. Its diagnosis is based on gram staining, microscopy, culture, sugar fermentation test and also oxidase test and catalase test. It is treated with third generation cephalosporins, rifampin and penicillin G. And that's it. Hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any suggestions, feel free to leave them below in the comments and I'll meet you soon. Assalamualaikum.